All right, let's, do, let's take your Bibles, open up to Isaiah, Isaiah 52, Isaiah chapter 52. I'm going to read first one, uh, one verse in Isaiah 52, then we're going to go to chapter 53 and we'll read all 12 verses. Isaiah 52 verse 14, as many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Chapter 53, who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. <clears throat> He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he hath done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins of many, and made, trans made intercession for the transgressors. Let's Father, we thank you for <clears throat> the good hymns tonight, the good spirit, and now especially for the reading of your word. And we pray that you would bless it, as always, to our spiritual understanding. We're very careful to understand that there are a number of us, hopefully all of us here and watching who are saved, but yet there could be someone uh, deceived or self-deceived and is still lost. And for that purpose, Father, we just ask that uh, the Holy Spirit bring the conviction that sin is still a wage that offers death, pays death, and there's no way to circumvent that except through what the Lord Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. And that we need to trust him, uh, believe on him in faith as our savior. We ask that you speak to each individual heart. Many of us have been saved a long time. We're as acquainted with this passage as, as even some of our folks that haven't been as saved as long. Uh, but yet there's, there's things here that we need to be mindful of, especially during this week. And so I pray that you would uh, speak through uh, me and deal with the, the infirmities and uh, strengthen whatever it is that is going to come out of my mouth and, and silence the things that, that shouldn't. And we just look for you to uh, work on our behalf. And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Okay, in the Word of God, there are specific chapters that stand out over the rest in different, I mean, we've got 66 books here. Uh, and it's not that these are any more inspired or any more needful than the others, but their substance is, is so rich. I, I kind of, it's difficult for me to think that I'm adequate to even speak of those. Uh, John chapter 3. Um, Romans chapter 8. Philippians chapter 2. It speaks about the mind of God, the mind of Christ. Hebrews chapter 10, and the one sacrifice for all, and chapter 11, the, the faith chapter. And of course here, Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, these are... These are tremendous chapters in, in the Word, and it does us well to be acquainted with them. Uh, about six months ago, I contacted a Messianic ministry that uh, is down in the south part of Florida, not all the way down, and uh, bought a hoodie sweatshirt from them, uh, and it has on the front uh, Isaiah, 53, and it says underneath, this chapter will change your life. And I don't usually wear that all around. We have a, we have a, Linda and I have a Hebrew uh, passage of scripture that we took up into the Carolinas with us, and that was, a, that was really something. Are you Jew, are you Jewish? <laughs> no, what does that say? And so it, it, it was amazing that it opened up so many doors. So I just got that for that reason. Isaiah 53 will change your life. If you understand Isaiah 53, uh, you are way ahead of the curve. Uh, I mean, way ahead. Most people haven't even come to that part of the highway. So uh, the words we read or read were written some 700 years uh, before the birth of Christ. And Isaiah here describes the coming, that the coming Christ would bear the sin of humanity and provide for the salvation of all who would call on him in faith. It was a clearer prophecy than Genesis 3.15. Now we know Genesis 3.15 is the first prophecy of, a, of one to come that would deal with the devil and sin. But it wasn't as clear is what Isaiah writes. And this is, you know, we have progressive revelation. And so by the time he's writing this, a lot of things are more well known than they were before. So as we look at this, I want to consider one phrase, which I'll meander all over the, the place with. And it's in verse 3. And it says, a man of sorrows. So we have in our hymn book, uh, I, said this, I said this morning in, in Sunday schools that repetition is theological glue. And so we had a hymn this morning, which is, I already had this in, in uh, my notes. But man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. Ruin sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. And I thought, isn't that interesting that, that Brandon picked that one that of all the hymns he could have picked, and that was something that I was going to be speaking about. So we're going to take this in parts. And the first part is the suffering Savior. So I want to read verse 3, part of verse 3, and then all of verse 4. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows. Down to verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. All right, the first part of this that I'm dealing with is that he was, there was an emotional suffering taking place. Now, there's different parts. This is not the sum total. Isaiah describes that the Lord Jesus Christ would bear the grief of humanity and carry our sorrows as he faced Calvary head on. There was no hesitation there. The prayer in the garden was, you knew how the prayer in the garden was going to end. He sweat drops of, as it were, great drops of blood and, and said, uh, if it be possible, let this, 
capacity, and then it was nevertheless not my will, but your will be done, and it was settled. So our griefs carry the idea of sickness, but it also refers to the grief that oftentimes is associated with sickness. So as he walked here in his public ministry, most of the time people think that oh, this, this all has to do with the cross. How, how, how well was he treated during his public ministry? He was hated. I mean, we have a description here way beyond the cross. Uh, and so as he walked through his public ministry, he bore the grief and the sorrow of humanity before he ever went to the cross. And he was prepared to pay the sin debt well into advance, before the foundation of the earth, the world. So he endured and despised the rejection of those who should have embraced him. I think of, you know, I wasn't very learned in the scriptures because obviously I wasn't in a Bible-believing, teaching church, but I knew some things, but I didn't embrace him. I knew of him. I knew about him. But never ever did I think of embracing him because I never knew what he did was for me. It was generic, you know, the whole world. Uh, and, and the mockery and ridicule, he didn't deserve that, obviously, uh, because he came to save those and yet they mocked him and ridiculed. Uh, I can't begin to tell you the number of times I and my friends took his name in derision and shame before I was ever saved. Can I? I'm glad I don't even remember. And it's it's fortunate that I've been saved so long that I don't remember. Uh, but but I know who I was before I was saved, and uh, and here I understand as I'm reading through here, he endured great emotional suffering for us, for me. The rest of verse 3 says, and, and acquainted with grief, and, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Okay, in verse 3, there's also physical suffering. He offered himself as the atonement for our very debt of sin, which means that blood had to be shed as manifested by the entire sacrificial system, all pointing to him, which means there had to be death. In verse 14 of chapter 52, we get a small glimpse of the physical suffering. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Now, in, in communion times, I've, I've gone into this a little bit. Uh, we, we, have, we have no conception of how bad the physical suffering was, other than a picture in scripture. Excuse me a minute. <coughs> we, can, uh, we can imagine things from drawings, from movies, if you want, but the scripture here makes it so impossible to understand why would you do this to any human being at any time, for any reason. That's how bad it was. And then not only the, the, uh, the physical suffering and emotional suffering, but there was a spiritual suffering in verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. I think this was probably the most difficult to bear. I don't know what your pain level is. Uh, some of us have very low pain levels, some of us have higher pain level. Some of us can take more than others. He never said a word. I think his pain level was extremely high. He never said a word. You don't hear him screaming, saying stop, no more, no more. He just, he just took it. Uh, the spiritual suffering must be the most difficult to bear. Let me, let me put it this way, as with loved ones, the spiritual chasm 
that that is is over spiritual issues and causes you know separation here the holy righteous sinless son of god endured all of our sin on the cross yours and mine imagine having to deal with your sin alone imagine having to deal with the entire debt of sin you owed and since you weren't born yet you owed way beyond today as long as the lord gives you life and you still sin he paid for that imagine we're having to deal with that personally before the righteous judge at the throne but let's not stop there let's having to judge or, or bear your parents sin as well and then your children's sin and then your brothers or your sisters your husbands or your wives your girlfriends or your boyfriends imagine all the people in this auditorium that you would have to bear the full debt of sin of every one of them in this auditorium and the people that watch on live stream imagine bearing the burden of debt of the debt of sin in your neighborhood people in your neighborhood and school and work and then imagine from Adam to the last human being created at the end of time all that sin was imputed upon Christ at one time and all of that sin was screaming for justice for death death of the sinners amazing uh, go back to the book of Job uh, Job chapter 1 speaking of this thing about the spiritual being being the most difficult to deal with Job suffered in different ways than our Lord suffered obviously but we read here in verse 1 there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil and there were born unto him seven sons three daughters his substance was also three seven thousand sheep three thousand camels 500 yoke of oxen 500 she asses and a great very great household so that this man was the greatest of all in the men of the east and his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day in his day and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them and it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that job sent and sanctified them rose up early in the morning offered burnt offerings according to the number of them for job said it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their heart this did job continually what was his primary objective as the richest man in the east the spiritual welfare welfare of his children and what they were doing well the Lord cared for the spiritual welfare of all mankind at one time Job had ten children he was concerned about them and you know he, I, it's difficult to imagine all of that being imputed onto him and when you read about the three hours of darkness from noon to three in the afternoon it took a long time to pay the debt there was a lot of sin that needed to be paid and never had his fellowship been broken with the father never he never had to, he never had committed any sin whatsoever and in second Corinthians let's turn there chapter 5 second Corinthians chapter 5 and let's look here at the last verse verse 21 for he speaking of God has made him speaking of Christ to be sin for us so God has made Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him he came and he endured this in order for us to be to be forgiven and to be his child to his children through faith in Christ all of that all of that to come to this place 
So now the second thing I want to look at is substitution. First the suffering, now the substitution. And in verse 4, the severity of it. He has, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, sick, and smitten of God and afflicted. I don't think there should be any question that his suffering was worse than any man ever has endured. I've read a lot about the Holocaust. I've read about the different situations and the, the horrendous treatment of the Holocaust, and yet they pale in comparison to what he went through. For us, beaten, humiliated beyond recognition, but the physical can't compare to the judgment he endured on my behalf, on your behalf, on our behalf. The full wrath of God in judgment was poured out on him. Picture what we know about the coming tribulation. Is the tribulation God's wrath being poured out on the earth for seven years? Yes. Well, we look going to Revelation 6, and we read of six of the seven seals being opened, and we have a false peace, and then we have war, and then we have where man starts killing one another, and a famine so bad that the basic foods are beyond reach to buy, and then a death so great that one quarter of the earth's populations are killed. And then there's martyrdom, martyrdom. And then there's anarchy. And then in verses 16, look, look, Revelation 6, 16 and 17. We read of these things many times unattached from them. And yes, I don't believe we're going to be here for them, but somebody lost that may hear this message will be here for those. And we shouldn't detach ourselves from them. And so in verse 16, well, verse 15, and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in, in, in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Now, that's not freemen back there. That's just free men. <laughs> and, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne for the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. Who shall be able to stand? And as we read on, we get it, we're just getting started. We have the seven trumpets, and in one of them, one third of the remaining population is killed. And still, let's go to Revelation 9. Revelation chapter 9. And we'll go down here into verse 18. By these three, and you can read the, ver the verses before, was the third part of the men killed by the fire, by the smoke, by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths, for their powers in their mouths and their tails. Their tails were like unto serpents, and they had heads. And <clears throat> with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. And then you pass on to the seven bowl judgments, the vials. More pain, more death. It's, it's, almost, it's almost too much to just deal with this. My sin, your sin, all sin was imputed to him, and he faced the full force of the wrath of the Father on him in our place. I can't imagine. I can't even imagine reading this and understanding. And yet, here was the wrath of God being poured out of him, and yet we know the Lord Jesus Christ is the love of God. And so we have, we have wrath and judgment meeting in order for him to do what he did. It's penalty here in verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. 
He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Again, he died, he died there with purpose to pay the debt of sin through his blood and redeem us out of the slave market of sin. He alone was worthy and able to provide such atonement. No religion, no institution, no churches uh, were, were capable of ever doing that and are not capable. Some people, you know, try to do that, but they can't do it. In verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Most people assume that the Lord Jesus could condemned and crucified because of the chief priests and elders, the Sanhedrin. And that they, in fact, uh, convinced Pilate to, to do so. But we read here in John chapter 10. Let's go here to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, look here in verse 17. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So they played a part in... in of course, his, his crucifixion. But really, he came to fulfill the plan of redemption that was formed before the foundation of the world. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. That was you, that was me. And the vehicle to do that was the cross. It wasn't strangulation. It wasn't lethal injection. It was the cross and the blood of the cross. You know, there are people that say he didn't need, the blood doesn't save, and so he could have paid for sin through lethal injection, or being hung, or a variety of other ways, suffocation. It's blasphemy. Without the shedding of blood, no remission of sin. Also in verse 6, we see the transgression of all men. All we like sheep have gone astray. All men seek the ways of the flesh and engage in sin. It's who we are before we're saved, and the penalty is death. And so therefore, all of us need a savior to provide salvation, to redeem us from sin. And where is that found? It can only be in one person, the Lord Jesus Christ, only one, ever. And so God provided the way. Our guilt transferred to Christ, he bore it so that we could be taken, redeemed to God. And in paying the great price, God was, sac was satisfied with what he did. It's called the propitiation. God was satisfied with the payment Christ made, and it will never be made again. I feel sad for places that say that uh, oh, we're, gonna, we're going to re- in, in, uh, visit the, the unbloody mass again and again and again and re-crucify Christ again and again and again. He's crucified one time. There's one offering for all. There's never going to be another one. And it's, it's just a hoax uh, that they perpetrate on people. So I look and I say, I'm dealing with something that exceeds my wisdom to comprehend fully. But does it negate the truth that it reveals and the promises that it assures? He took my place. He took your place. I, I, and, and the reason I make it personal is that I was never told that it was me that he died for. That me that he shed his blood for. I didn't even know he shed his blood. And for me that he resurrected. It was... It was those people that don't believe the truth and those people that don't believe the truth and the people who are there that don't believe the truth and the people that don't go anywhere that don't believe the truth. They, all of those were included. And yet, they weren't included. He, prayed, he paid the price in full. 
If he paid the price in full, how much does that leave you to pay for? Now, when I went to school, we had, we had addition and subtraction, multiplication and division. We didn't have this nut nonsense that goes on today. And so if something is paid for in full, I pay nothing. He did it all. He paid it all. <laughs> and so salvation is offered for all who come to him in faith. It's always been that way. It always will be that way. So there's no reason for anybody to remain accountable for their debt of sin and condemned to eternal judgment. There's no reason. I blamed my past. I told the preacher, I can't be saved because I've done too much. Well, where did I get that thought? I got that from the church which, which had the scales of justice and injustice. If you're good, if you believe in your good, you'll go to heaven. If you believe in your bad, you'll go to hell. And so I, my small mind figured, boy, I've done too much. And it took him a few hours to, for me to grasp that we're all in the same boat here. We're all sinners. Whether it's one sin, a hundred, a hundred sins, a thousand, we're all sinners. And we all need to be saved by grace through faith. And we all can be saved by grace through faith. But if you fail to receive them, if a person that's listening or watching fails to receive them by faith as Savior, all that sin, all that sin will fall on you forever. You don't even have to be a businessman to understand. I would be foolish to pass that up. Not that this is a business transaction. It's a spiritual transaction. This is what he did. You know, we followed, and the, the messages this morning was really good as we just walked through and saw all the things. This is what was going on under the surface. This is part, uh, no wonder I, Isaiah is such a hated book. This chapter is, you just, just you can't ever exhaust it. it. Has 12 verses. There's 12 mentions of the substitutionary, substitutionary atonement. It's not one per verse, but there's, there's 12 in there. And, if, and you can read it. He has borne our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. Everything was us. He did, all of this was for us. So the hymn we sang this morning, I, I can't remember what stanza it was, us, but it ended this way. Lifted up was he to die. In his finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah, what a savior. We don't, we don't go through this week with great sorrow. We go through this week with great joy. And yet we also understand the great cost that our salvation was provided for. I'm thankful that I'm saved. Paul and I were talking in the office he said, you know, I've never, I've never seen Christ, but I know I'm saved. Well, I've never seen him either. But I said, but I can take you to Ernest Angley. He said he's seen him. <laughs> but no, you understand. We, we take the word and we believe the word. Uh, as written, we've called on the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. He saved us, but it's good to know what, what he did insofar as our debt was paid. We can't, we can't ever, we can't ever get to the place where we use, use this or treat this as this commonplace because we need to know. Let's pray. As you bow your heads here this, this evening, I'm not sure where your heart is I might have some idea, uh, but, I, but I don't know. You've heard it enough if you've been here any time at all. Christ came for you. He died for you. He shed his blood for you. Uh, he was resurrected for you. You receive him by faith as Savior. 
Uh, you can be saved. If you don't, you perish. But this is something that you settle with your own heart. He knows your heart. He knows exactly where you are spiritually. If you're not saved, he wants to save you. And you can be saved. We give invitations. Nothing wrong with invitations. They're healthy, they're good. People, do, we can do uh, business with the Lord. And if you're troubled about whether you're, or not you're saved or you know you're not, just come on, let us show you how you can be sure. There's no shame in that. Matter of fact, there's just joy in that. And for we who are saved, I just ask that maybe the Lord has spoken to our hearts, got a hold of a, of a portion of our hearts that maybe we've been saved long enough that we take these things for granted. No man could have ever devised a plan like this. And yet God did. And we believe him. And what are we? We're nothing. We're, we're, we're just nothing, and yet, undeservedly so, he died for us. And we, when we realize the truth of that, what fools we would have been to reject him and say, no, I'm going to believe my church. I'm going to believe my whatever and wind up perishing for all eternity. So as the Lord speaks to our heart uh, this week, tonight, let's, let's draw close to him. The invitation this morning is just a closer walk with thee. Boy, we need that. He wants to, be, he wants to draw close to us. But we're going to have to draw close to him first. And there may be somebody here that's saved, never followed the Lord in believer's baptism. This might be a good opportunity. We're a small group here to uh, indicate your intent on being baptized uh, by immersion afterwards, identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection. And if so, we would welcome that intent. And again, we, we have visitors from time to time. And if you're visiting and the Lord's impressed upon your heart to join in with this local church, this may be a good time to make that intent known as well. So however the Lord's working in our hearts, then you come. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the marvelous way in which you have provided for us everything. Beginning of his salvation. Because everything rises and falls on that. Everything rises and falls on the spiritual. It doesn't matter about the material. It doesn't matter about the power we may have or the, uh, the popularity we may have. It's the spiritual. And it shouldn't burden our hearts when we see what's happening uh, to people, to churches, to ministries, they're just crumbling. So Father, have your way to work in our hearts. We know that we can do all things through you. The Lord Jesus Christ would strengthen us. We need that strength, we don't have it ourselves. And so have your way in the invitation for we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.